So we'll, we'll just give it a second, let, let people join us. Um, and let's begin. So um, welcome to our Ethics Center lecture for October 5th. I'm Andrew Fiala. I'm the director of the Ethics Center here at Fresno State and a professor of philosophy. Um, as you know, the lecture we're going to hear this evening from Dr. Candace Shelby is entitled Living a Whole Life, Body and Soul. It's going to be really interesting, I think. I've heard a version of this before, so I think it's going to, I think you'll find it very interesting. Um, before we get started, let me just uh, say thank you to Fresno State Alumni Association who helped set this Zoom webinar up. And also thanks to Eduardo Tovar, who is my student assistant here this semester. Um, we do events like this, uh, five or six of these a semester, lectures, panel discussions. Um, and the goal of this kind of thing is to model civil discourse, to engage in critical thinking, um, and really inspire students in the community to take ethics and philosophy and critical thinking seriously. So that's the spirit of what we've got going here. Um, our next lecture will be on October 26th. That's going to be a talk by Christian Mateus on oppression, aggression, and peace literacy. That'll also be interesting. So let me quickly introduce Professor Shelby, and then I'll get out of her way and let her talk. So Candace Shelby is a professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado in Denver. She has a PhD from Rice University. And in her time at Denver, she served as both department chair and executive director for the Center for Ethics and Community. I guess she's also working with the Ethics Bowl team, which I just learned uh, as we got together this evening. Her specialties include epistemology, metaphysics, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of psychology. In 2016, she published a book with the title Addiction, A Philosophical Perspective. I took a look at that this afternoon. It's actually really interesting. Um, I got to know Candace through the Society for Philosophy in the Contemporary World, and she's been an active member in that group, and she's gonna be the conference host next summer when that group meets here in Fresno. So looking forward to working with her on that. So what will happen here is that Professor Shelby will talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and that'll leave plenty of time for conversation and discussion. So students and audience members, feel free to post questions to the chat or use the Q&A function. We'll keep our eye on that. Um, and you know, the only rule of thumb there is this is a professional academic setting. So use your best behavior and you know, academic language and civil discourse, let's practice um, polite listening and and uh, use our best behavior in the chat. I appreciate that. Okay, so with that being said, uh, Professor Shelby, we're really glad you're with us. The floor is yours. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me here. I'm going to start, and most of this talk, you're going to see my screen share. Um, I'm going to share some slides with you. Most mostly just pictures of things that are illustrating what I'm talking about. Um, so let me get that screen share set up and then I'll just start. Okay, so um, in the 1980s, a way of thinking about thinking which is different from the view espoused by the thinkers like Descartes, um, began to take hold in philosophy as well as in psychology and in robotics and later in neuroscience. Rather than thinking of the mind as a disembodied self or in some later version, something like pure computation, and in either case, totally rational, separate from emotion and movement, um, this way of thinking about thinking maintained that the body or the body's interactions with the environment either constitute or contribute to uh, cognitive processes. Um, and that's because there are some more radical and some more conservative versions of this view. On this kind of view, thinking is not something that just happens in the mind or even just in the brain, but thinking is more of a whole body process. This approach to understanding thinking, known as embodied cognition, was pop popularized by the American philosopher, Mark Johnson, who maintained that not just some cognition, but all cognition, no matter how lofty, abstract, inspiring, spiritual, firmly is seated in the neural systems that subserve our 
perceptual systems, including the proprioceptual system, the affective systems like feeling and emotional systems, and motivational and the movement systems of the brain. The main thrust of the work here was to explain how our thinking arises from our being the particular kinds of organisms that we happen to have evolved into. So for instance, Johnson maintains that since we're upright and forward facing, we experience things as either in front of us or behind us or to our left or right or up or down. And we encounter obstacles as things that we must go around, over, through, into, or deal with in some way. So all of our concepts and everything else, no matter how lofty they may seem, are mediated through physical experiences. On this kind of view, the contents of thought are all metaphorical and they're derived from operations of the body. In this talk, I want to extend that view based on a complex dynamic systems analysis of the body-mind and show how I think we can better understand the ways that we reason about living well by extending the embodied cognition argument beyond claims regarding the contents of the mind to a discussion of some notable features of the mind. That is, by employing a complex dynamic systems analysis of the human body-mind, we can better see not only how our thinking works, but we can also illuminate the parallels between some aspects of psychological and physical health. So basically, I'm rejecting the notion assumed by many embodied mind theorists that the essential thing is that there's a one directional mapping from bodily experiences and activities to concepts. So I'm arguing from my part instead that body and mind are actually two levels of description of the same complex dynamic system, which implies that the relationship between physical concepts and psychological ones is much richer and dynamic that we might, than we might so far have understood. And that further, some of these concepts are metaphors of each other, and they can operate as guides for living well, physically and psychologically, and that is for flourishing generally. Since I began practicing yoga regularly under a good guidance two and a half years ago, I began to see that not only are there bodily bases for psychological and other abstract concepts, but in addition, I've observed that there seem to be real mental properties that have causal efficacy with respect to physical properties, and especially those from which our concepts are allegedly derived. In other words, concepts that somebody like Mark Johnson would say rely on perceptions of physical properties and actions can actually represent mental properties that influence our physical properties. And if that's true, then we have reason to believe that the metaphors that we live by, which is the title of one of Johnson's books, may not after all be the result of a one-way physiological development process from concrete interactions with the physical world to the abstract. Perhaps we can think instead in terms of metaphors because the physiological and the psychological are two different levels of experience, two different descriptions of the same system equally fundamental, but different. So our concepts, particularly some that weigh in on our well-being, are best understood as parallel, and maybe as informing one another, that rather than being derived in a, from a unidirectional pattern. In my understanding, all living things are self-organizing complex adaptive systems. Self-organizing systems are ubiquitous throughout nature, in crystal formation, the flocking behavior of birds, in the social behavior of bees and ants, and in the development of organisms like us. When organisms replicate, cells start to multiply and to self-organize. In complex organisms, tissues emerge from the adaptations and interactions of numbers of cells, both with one another and with their environments, and through the adaptations of and interactions among those structured groups of cells, organs emerge and systems of more organs, etc. Importantly, at some level of organization in certain animals, mind emerges based on the interactions and adaptations of various features of the organism, both internally and crucially externally, given that every organism is always in an environment that could either be supportive or threatening. 
because of its necessary interactions with its environment, directedness and responsiveness in the organism emerge. At some level of complexity, that directedness and responsiveness um, causes thought to emerge, organized by concepts that develop and are employed as is useful to the organism. First of all, to maintain the process of constantly adapting toward homeostasis, that is staying alive within its ever changing environment. From these beginnings, more complex purposes can arise from which then more complex concepts come up to deal with those situations. Mind and body on this view are two levels of description of the same complex adaptive system. The features of each the features of each level can give rise to concepts, which in turn influence and can be influenced by the features of the other. Thinking of ourselves as both essentially minded and as essentially embodied tells us something important about how we can approach creating fulfilling, flourishing lives for ourselves. In medicine, Um, on your slides <laughs> the, the slides are not they're not doing any changing all right then you might try try going out and restarting if you care to we just restart that slideshow maybe In, I'm sorry, in medicine and kinesiology research, and more particularly in longevity research, several physical factors are often stressed as essential for ongoing health and well being. They include uh, balance or stability, flexibility, strength, and endurance. Some call these the four pillars of ongoing health. The literature represents them as important physical properties that can be improved with work with physical trainers and with good practice. These same terms though are emphasized with reference to psychological and spiritual well-being in yoga. And in this tradition of instruction, it's also said that these traits can be acquired and improved with training and good practice. I want to address each of these and to show how the parallels are more than metaphorical, largely based on the observed fact that improvement or deterioration of these qualities on the mental side can influence their physical counterparts and the improvement or deterioration of the qualities on the physical side can influence the qualities of their mental counterparts. I'm not claiming that this happens in every case, but rather I'm arguing that the possibility of this kind of influence speaks to a richer kind of connection between body and mind than we might have thought about otherwise. Consider, for example, balance or stability. Personal trainers, physical therapists and longevity researchers alike emphasize stability for physical health and avoidance of injury. This is not optional. Falls account for a large percentage of hospitalizations in older populations, and in many of those, the beginning of a process of ultimate physical decline. I'm not sure how many of you saw the results of that seven-year-long Brazilian study about the connection between being able to balance on one foot for 10 seconds and longevity, but that study made quite the splash in the news. It was done over seven years, and in those seven years, 7% 7 of the participants died. The proportion who died among those who couldn't stand on one foot for 10 seconds was 17.5%, while the proportion of those who died in the group who could manage it was only 4.5%. Because the effect of balance on health has long been intuitively understood, stability exercises involving balance falls, um, kneeling opposite arm leg stretches, and yoga poses such as tree and eagle are included in yoga and other classes at gyms all over the country. But balance is also a fundamental characteristic of psychological health. In fact, we hear about work-life balance for our mental health on campuses all the time. That's not to say that much is done to support it, but still, it seems to be officially valued. Being grounded and stable is essential, as the Stoics and others teach us, for managing everyday life, 
perhaps now more than ever. It's important, it's part of what the phenomenon of quiet quitting is about. With every day bringing new uncertainties, challenges, and demands, being able to respond from a place of stability becomes essential, not just for flourishing, but even for survival. But it doesn't seem to me that this concept of mental balance is simply metaphorically derived from the physical. Numerous psychological studies have shown that from their various earliest days, babies understand when things are unfair, when someone's doing something to someone else. For example, a study published recently by Kylie Damelin at the University of British Columbia showed that in a study of 100 infants, over three-fourths of these five-month-old babies preferred a moose puppet who gave things to somebody over one that took things. A similar study with 21-month-old infants showed that the majority of them would give a treat to a helpful puppet and would take away a treat from a puppet that harmed somebody else. From this evidence, it's tempting to say that children learn an abstract psychological concept of balance, which I take justice or fairness to be, even though, even as they're learning the physical concept, rather than obviously deriving the former from the latter. It's not as though five-month-old children are experimenting with standing up or putting things on tables before they show the use of these more morally directed conceptions of balance. Further, consider the fact that lack of mental balance can influence physical balance and vice versa. For example, if one is performing a balancing yoga exercise and begins to think distressing thoughts, the pose will be dropped almost without fail. Think about trying that standing on one foot exercise while reading on your phone, for example. On the other hand, the more time that a person spends training themselves to focus on the center of their body through something like yoga or certain sports, the better one's able to deal with uneven physical ground and sudden trips and stops. Further, as most of us have experienced, all you have to do to get all worked up and angry um, is to, I mean, if you want to get all, um, furthermore, let me just say this easily, all you have to do is get all worked up and angry if you want to start dropping things in the kitchen or on the sports court. That's what the trash talk is for. It's to put your opponent off center. Likewise, we know both from psychological studies and from our own experience that being thrown off physical balance curbs our mental, um, disturbs our mental balance, both in serious and in inconsequential ways. Let me give you another study to think about. In 1974, two researchers, Dutton and Aaron, created a psychological study involving subjects either on or off a shaky bridge. In the study, a group of men were stopped after stepping off a shaky suspension bridge and given a survey by a female confederate of the research team, along with her phone number in case they had any questions. A control group of men were approached by the same woman on flat ground. In the study, more men stepping off the shaky bridge later called the confederate. Mistaking their feelings of arousal caused by anxiety for feelings of attraction, they were thrown off mentally by being put off balance by being on that shaky bridge. But this parallel shows up in certain more serious circumstances too. It's become common practice, for example, when somebody visits a doctor, even for something totally unrelated, for the physician to ask, maybe this is only for people of a certain age, I don't know, whether the patient has had any falls or fear of falling lately. And this is almost immediately followed in succession by a question of whether the patient has ever had any recent uh, experiences of depression. I don't know how these issues have worked their way into routine medical exams, but it is interesting that questions regarding physical stability and questions regarding st psychological stability are asked in immediate succession. Okay. Now let's turn to flexibility. Certainly, we may learn the concept at first as one that involves our physical experiences. As with balance, it's a complex concept in any case, and it may well be that the fundamental concept is physical, based in the kind of physical beings that we are. But it could be that children are so automatically flexible mentally, like they are physically, that it just they never notice it until something calls, calls it to their attention. 
In an episode of um, the podcast, This American Life, for example, a tattling phone was put into a classroom of three to four year olds. And boy, did they put it to use. Interestingly, largely what they reported was either imbalances like injustices, for example, just, uh, Vanessa bit me for no reason. Samir just wouldn't give me the puzzle, but it was my turn. But also another major category of tattles concerned inflexibility, such as Michael just wouldn't listen. And I told him and I told him. So although these children tattled 30 or 40 times a day at first, it's notable that they stopped using that tattling phone within a few weeks when nothing changed as a result of their using it. When one of the children was asked about why they thought people weren't using it anymore, he said that it didn't work. The children expected that when they tattled, some sort of adjustment would be brought about. When nothing happened and the phone was inflexible, the children just lost interest. So there's one tiny bit of evidence that inflexibility in the psychological sense is experienced from early on. What's more, one of the goals of such practices as yoga is to help practitioners to become more flexible, not only in their bodies, but also, and more importantly for many, with respect to their attitudes toward discomfort, toward the possible motivations of others, and with respect to their own views. In fact, I know of a year-long study taught by a Colorado yogi called Unlearning, the sole purpose of which was to help individuals to learn to think different about such things as racism, sexism, sexual identityism, and, so, and other kinds of places where people tend to be dogmatic without noticing. The idea is that learning to use flexion of the body can make mind more open and flexible. On the other side, we might consider the coincidence that physical inflexibility comes with age, um, at least as it is very often accompanied by greater mental inflexibility as well. In these cases, we see the sedimentations rise together. Again, however, I'm not making a strong causal claim. I don't claim that philosophers who seriously follow Socrates' instruction to distrust our opinions and change our minds in the face of conv convincing arguments, not that he did that, um, will result in our being able to touch our toes. I'm simply making the claim that it's wrong to believe that the concept of flexibility is essentially a function of certain parts of our bodies being able to bend. Then at that sort of physical uh, experience of being able to bend is then used metaphorically to describe some psychological phenomenon. We observe concrete cases of mental inflexibility early and independently of cases of physical inflexibility. My belief is that this is because our minds are as fundamental to us as the kinds of organisms that we are, as are our bodies. In any case, although I can agree that all thinking is doing, I don't see any reason to agree with embodied cognition theorists that our abstract concepts are derivative from physical experiences, unless you broaden the term physical to the level that I have. A third example, um, let's turn to strength. As we know, this physical attribute is essential to health, particularly as we age. It's difficult to maintain, but it's one of the best indicators of longevity. Grip strength is one of the most studied biomarkers of longevity. According to the NIH, it's predictor of, all over, of overall strength, bone mineral density, and it's also indicative of fractures, falls, malnutrition, cognitive impairment, sleep problems, and depression in addition to a higher risk of all cause mortality. Strength can only be earned and maintained through continual effortful exertion. Although in most people, it's fairly natural in youth, but it diminishes over time unless it's actively pursued. Significant physical strength influences mental strength, just as mental strength can influence physical strength. Here I'm thinking about Olympic and professional athletes of all sorts. Only those with the greatest mental strength can put up with the pressure that it takes to face both the endless, exhausting training regimens and the psychological pressures of facing intimidating opponents and judges and crowds and all of that stuff involved in performing at those levels. 
But notice, a physical injury can break a person in these situations. We've all seen it with athletes of all kinds. And the road back to physical strength is fraught with psychological intimidation. This happened to me, by the way, in the fall of, 19, of 2021, when a stress fracture took me off the jogging path. I'd been dealing with not only the stress of the pandemic, but also with some pretty tremendous personal stress just fine until that injury occurred. And then I spent two weeks on the couch in a TB induced in coma. It was difficult to do my job, even though nothing required me to move out of the house. I felt significantly weakened as had been covered in the press that countless other people had who had been infected with COVID had, but not only in my body, but in my mind. It was all that I could do to meet my classes on Zoom. But as the leg healed and the ability to support my weight increased, my mood returned to normal. We're all familiar with cases that operate in the opposite direction too. When a person becomes depressed, for example, it often appears to them to be impossible to get out of bed, much less to move around, let alone to lift heavy things or think about hard things. Even a washcloth can seem weighty. Finally, the relations between physical endurance and mental endurance seem parallel as well, with the relation of mutual influence existing between them both. Endurance is something that must be developed in both physical and mental senses. Little kids, as all parents know, drop a quarter mile into a hike two hours into a day at the amusement park, and even as they're growing older and taller and stronger, unexpectedly on bike rides or jobs. But likewise, unless they're plied with the addictive sort of unexpected rewards that you get like from things like gaming, um, they, have to, they have a difficult time sustaining effort during challenging mental experiences. In fact, all of us at any age are susceptible to lack of mental endurance, even those of us trained in challenging fields such as philosophy. As Daniel Kahneman explained in his bestseller, Thinking Fast and Slow, we all give up and take the easy way out all the time when presented with challenging mental exercise. Thinking is effortful. And so unless we've been specially trained for a very long time, we all give up almost immediately. In fact, as Kahneman says about his own self, even after we've been trained, we still do it every chance we get. Mental endurance in the sense of intellectual endurance is difficult. Like strength trainers though, Endurance athletes must possess and constantly employ mental endurance or they would never be able to become endurance athletes. I'm sure we've heard all these athletes say that the running, swimming, biking, hiking, climbing, Mount Everest stuff is just as much mental as it is physical. I don't believe they're mistaken when they say this. And I don't think that what they're saying is metaphorical. The body must be trained to be capable of such feats and mental endurance is not different. How can somebody survive years and years of impossibly stressful situations? For the example, or for example, mothers of black sons. When I hear these women speak of what they constantly prepare for, how they must mother, what they must teach and prepare themselves for in order to minimize the danger to their sons and be ready for in the event of the not, the not so unexpected happens compared with how I blithely obsessed while raising my own son, I just think, how can they possibly do it? They can do it because their mothers and aunts and grandmothers and friends had to mother in just the same way. They've trained since childhood to endure not just this, but so many more things that many of us find impossible. Does that translate to physical endurance? Well, biomedical research might suggest otherwise. The black maternal uh, mortality rate is two to three times that of white women and life expectancy for black women is four years shorter than for white women. But for us to understand what that really means in terms of endurance, we would have to be comparing apples to apples, which we're clearly not doing in medical treatment. But the history of the US culture has depended since its inception on the endurance black mothers who required to do everything with basically nothing. We can't check the aptness of my parallel here with any rigor, but we might say that reason to, um, we might say that there's reason to accept the concept of endurance does not obviously come from developing an abstract metaphor 
from physical experiences and processes. The psychological concept may well be developed before physical experiences could possibly found, provide the grounds for metaphorical conceptual development. So how are we to think about these physical psychological pillars, however they're derived? Are they something like virtues to be pursued? And if so, to what extent? And how are they to be balanced? A professor of mine in grad school offered me advice once um, saying something like, broad-mindedness was good. I was one who took classes in everything, but not when it resulted in flat-headedness. And we know that pushing physical strength too far can limit flexibility, both mentally and physically. Some bodybuilders, for example, get so bulky that they can't bend in the ways required to do the most ordinary tasks, like dry their hair, while other people may show great mental discipline, but when that discipline is developed too far, it can turn into inflexibility that can veer toward obsession. But it's not clear that these four pillars of health all work like virtues. I'm not sure, for example, how one could be too balanced or have too much endurance, although it certainly can be the case that one ought not to have to have extreme amounts of mental endurance, um, but that's about circumstances rather than about physical or mental characteristics. It does seem to me, however, that the ideal for a flourishing life would be to work on all four pillars, both mentally and physically, to the degree that's compatible with a similar development of the others, which might mean that balance plays a more central role than any of the others. And one final thought. Woven into this investigation, there we go. Woven into this investigation are several spiritual psychological concepts often used in yoga practice and instruction and separately in physical training and instruction. My favorite one is lead with the heart. You have a problem with ineffective or injury causing squats, lead with the heart, and that'll be immediately improved. Poor posture, ineffective biceps curls, hold your head back while lifting something, hurt your back while lifting something, lead with the heart, and your form will improve and injuries will be avoided. The same is true in psychological and social work. The unprecedented violence that our country is experiencing, as well as the many social inequities and political divisions that we're undergoing, not to mention depression and anxiety, and in my own special area, um, my own area of specialization, in the intractable and tragic effects of addiction, with all of the, the effects that these things are having on us, maybe they could all be mitigated to an enormous extent by our learning to just lead with the heart. And as I've tried to show, that's not an abstract derivative concept, but one that instead is derived from our existence as psychological as well as physical beings. And I'm stopping the share because I am ready now for some questions if anybody has it. Yeah, thank you, Candace, uh, Professor Shelby. Thank you very much. Um, and so for the audience out there, we'll use the chat function in the Q&A function to take questions. Um, while we're waiting for the audience to generate some questions, I had a couple. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll, we'll give the audience a chance to catch up with us. Um, uh, what about, you know, you mentioned the, the thinking quick and slow, that, that, what about speed? I mean, as of the four pillars, it seems like, and certainly with aging, speed and, and quickness are a thing, right? I mean, literally you, your body slows down and your mental- Yeah, it sure does. Down. Yeah. So what I can say about that is, I don't know, I don't know, I've never seen any studies and I, I've read a bunch of that longevity re uh, research and I've never seen anybody showing um, an association between um, like, increasing speed and longevity or increasing speed and um, um, mitigation of uh, heart disease or cancer or something like that. But you do, you do get those kind of tests like the grip strength um, is, it's tightly correlated with things like um, 
uh, all cause mortality and with depression and all those things. And I think that's the reason that in the literature they're referred to as four pillars of um, of health, four pillars of wellness. But the if we're talking just about my little project, which is about these physical um, concepts are they they parallel uh, in, they parallel intellectual or mental concepts because of our just being complex dynamic system. So I think they're the same thing. So speed would be, uh, it would be something that I would say, of course, we experience, um, we experience physical speed and mental speed simultaneously because they are two sides of the same point. I, I'm, I just don't know like when, I don't have any evidence when children develop uh, a sense of, of, you know, speed. But I do know that you're right, that when we slow down in the one way, we slow down in the other way. And the only way to work on our speed, because I, I ran marathons for a bit. So I joined a, um, a running group and you have to run, you have to work on your speed all the time. And the same thing is true. Like when our students are trying to get through the LSAT, those puzzles, for example, but that is just a matter of practice right in the puzzle section they can really get they can get good at it they can increase their LSAT scores just by focusing on um, by practicing and so I find it really interesting that practice in both of these cases um, works the same way and also that aging it works the same way if you don't practice yeah th this this is really interesting um, we, we have a question from Elizabeth in the chat she says I think it's kind of about physical education in a sense. So Elizabeth says, do kids who do more physical activities have more balance in their lives uh, and, and then more grounded, such as kids who are put into more extracurricular activities after school and so on? Or do these kids seem to develop less balance because of stress and is it harder for them to flourish? And I think there's also a question like, how do we, you, you mentioned practice, like what do we do to, to, to be healthy mentally and physically? And how do we, how do we, raise good kids that are healthy and happy and, you know. Yeah, I'm, well, this is a great question to ask me because I'm a grandmother and I, uh, my, my son and daughter-in-law have their kids and this, this doesn't have anything to do with me, but they have their kids in basketball and cross country and in tennis, they're in swimming, they're in uh, vocal kinds of, um, they're one, two, one of them's in two choirs, they're in theater. Um, and I think, I mean, for one thing, I think that that balance ought to emerge more um, organically than we allow it, because what happens, I mean, what I see happening in those kids is that instead of their, their I mean, they're doing all these, one of them's in volleyball, one of them's in football. I mean, they're all in all of these various physical activities and they show up great in school and none of them get in trouble. Um, we haven't had any problems with the kids being um, I mean, none, none of them have had any sort of anxiety or depression disorders, which given that they range from 12 to 15 is, is a good sign. Um, but I do wonder about like balance also includes when do they not do something? Because what the thing that I see with the, the kids in my neighborhood and with my, my grandchildren, and their friends, is that in trying to balance them in all of these ways by giving them piano lessons and that, 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 and all of these other kinds of um, experiences, the one thing they don't have is downtime. And I wonder about, there are many, many levels of balance um, as well as balancing each of these things with each other. So I, we don't have good studies for one thing about, um, the only thing that we seem to have had any good studies about is associations between um, uh, suicide ideation in uh, teenagers and too much time on social media. So we we get when they don't when they only do one thing and it happens to be we don't know what the effects of that are in particular, but you can see an imbalance there. Because what you do see is all the, there's the opportunities I missed. There are all the perfect bodies. There's everybody going to do it, looking like this, doing this, having these things. And they're watching our TikToks all the time. Um, so that kind of imbalance 
um, does result in, I mean, higher reports of suicide, suicidal ideation. Um, about the other kinds, though, with their their physical activity, I I don't think that we've got good studies. You know, you you um, you mentioned in your talk both yoga and the ancient Greeks. Very briefly, you mentioned the Stoics. Um, you know, my my understanding is in you know in Plato's Republic, the education process was going to involve all kinds of parts, right? Music and and so on, and, and mathematics and physical activity. And I think that's there in the yogic traditions, although I know less about that. We don't do that really very well in our Western world. We don't think of education as a holistic mind-body thing, do we? And and what's wrong? What's wrong with us? How do we lose that? And and you know, how do we bring it back? Am I am I right that we've sort of lost that that holism? Oh, we definitely have. All you have to look is at the funding, right? So, um, if you look at public school funding, you see that the arts and and physical activity have been the cut and cut and cut in uh, all across the nation. And so, the I mean, when I was in fifth grade, right, that we all we were all introduced to music, music theory, we, we were taken to the opera, not that we enjoyed it, but we were taken there. And we, but we, but we all had exposure to music classes and we had to learn to play those little weird recorders. And we had to do, but, and, but we also were required to do physical activity. And as I've seen in the, the public schools in the last 20 years, because of a simple capitalistic thrust and a real urge to be competitive on the world stage in STEM in particular, which means also um, lack of um, lack of attention to the humanities and things like what Plato said about education or what anybody else wrote about anything. Um, we have we have tended to become very unbalanced in the way that we do education. Um, and that's that's simply about competitiveness. That's because American kids have shown up to be we're whatever it is, 37th or something in, in math proficiency. And so instead of thinking about, well, why are these kids not interested in math? Instead, it's pour more on, provide more um, standardized testing um, and focus more on those tests so that they'll do better. So we look better compared to Finland than we have been, but none of that is really focusing on what I and the humanities would call education. I mean, I'm very, I mean, very disappointed in that um, with my my grandkids' education, and they're they're all in AP classes, right? So everybody's advanced, everybody's pushing, everybody's doing everything, except that nothing really comes out of those classes because we're still not able to read and we're still not able to do math, and our children are, I I well, we know what what's happening with the mental health um, of our, especially with our adolescents. Right. This is um, especially particularly since COVID, but increasingly before COVID over the past um, 10 years, we've been we've been seeing increases in anxiety, depression and in particular suicidal ideation, which I just read yesterday has tripled in 10 years um, for boys. And this is I mean, this is clearly a case of we're not educating. We're doing something different. You know, um Candice, there's a there's a question in the chat, but before we go to that question, um, uh, this isolation problem of the COVID, I mean, like literally we, here we are, we're just heads on screens, right? It's, um, we are so disembodied and uh, the, the COVID experience, I wonder if, I mean, I don't know how you would study this exactly, but it's, you know, the depression and suicide and anxiety is is in a sense because we've become these disembodied beings who live on screens um, I, I don't know, do you have a comment about that? And it's sort of like our, our educational system too, just treats us as, treats, we treat students as, you know, performative pieces of paper in a sense, not as, as whole humans. What do you think about that? Yeah, I do think that. I, I, I think that um, we, 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 we treat them as, as entities to be trained to be, to, to perform rather than as, as um, persons to be nurtured. Um, but one of, the, uh, one of the things you said um, 
is is interesting to me because we not only have become these little disembodied beings, but apparently um, we think that's a great thing because now we are looking right to in, increase and improve and increase our virtual presence. And so we've got not only kids who are spending you know four hours a day uh, gaming against other disembodied beings or being mean to each other on 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 social media. But there are, but we also are are like touting that as our future, and you know I I I really worry about the fact that we 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 want to train our doctors. I I just read um, in Nature this morning about how um, doctors are going to be increasingly trained in virtual experiences. Um, they're increasingly doing which is surgery great. You can practice. Virtually, if you can get VR to be really good, where you're actually not cutting on real human beings, that seems to be a good practice before you do cut on real human beings. But the interviewing process is now doing being done with AI, and so and and so we're we're simulating our own selves and educating the doctors who already are not treating us as persons because of the way in which we depersonalize our society because of our insurance practices and a variety of other things. So. I, I think, I mean, I think I'll, this is, it's, it, I think it's all largely connected. The better thing that we could do would be um, to source, um, to find sources of community and go outside with each other. And right, the, the things that we do see that are great are community gardens and things where people are actually physically outside in each other's presence and doing something. Yeah, I, I think this the community element, the social element is probably very important too. Um, Isan uh, puts in the chat, what's the most crucial age for physical activity as it relates to mental growth or is physical activity always important when it comes to one's mental well-being? Well, if you look at little kids, you see that that's how they learn, right? So um, very little babies and, and, and toddlers they put everything in their mouths and they climb on everything and they reach out for everything. And I don't know if, if this is common knowledge or anything, but if we're not allowed to move, we never learn to see. So this is done on some really cruel experiments with uh, kittens where they take their eyes closed and people carried them around to everything that they needed. And then the kittens never could learn to see and move and manipulate their environments. This is part of the argument that I was making that we are complex dynamic systems in which every single part of us is interacted, integrated with every other part of us so that we can't learn to hear the Doppler effect unless we're stimulated in the right ways with motion in the real world. And so, um, when, when do we learn, when is it important? Well, it's important from the very, very beginning because that's when babies become, they learn to see and figure out that they have hands and feet and they learn what to do and they learn to move. And that's how they learn about three dimensionality because we can't see that, right? Our eyes, we have um, stereoscope, stereoscopic vision. They learn to see depth by moving their bodies in and out. And that's why the embodied theorists got such a good start because all of that's true. Um, but if you look at kindergartens or at Montessori schools or Waldorf schools, even though those schools go all the way through high school, they have, uh, they have people learning by physically doing things, by interacting, by building things, by exploring things. Um, so I don't think there's any time that it's not important for us to have physical movement as we're um, we're trying to to learn things, and of course, if you know at our at my end of the spectrum, because I'm a, at the grandmother end of the spectrum, physical activity is essential to staving off dementia, um, to being able to even do continual um, lifelong learning, because um, right, even though people think about doing Sudoku, people think about um, doing crossword puzzles or something, and those kinds of things, uh, playing brain games online as making us more mentally um, competent. None of that actually does anything except Im improve us at doing those particular things. Mm -hmm. But if we want universal capacity for learning, then physical activity is essential 
we need to be exercising, running and breathing um, and flexing and stretching and strengthening uh, more than anybody else. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, I, I, I just, I think you're right on something very important here that I like, I know when I'm working, think my doing my thought work, you know, cause I'm a philosophy professor. I, I, I actually need to move. I mean, I need to get up and walk around and I mean, it really helps to kind of, I don't know, clean the, clean the brain out a little bit. I think there's something to that. Yeah. Well, you know, um, most people will say things like, they had their best thoughts when they were in the shower or when they were taking a walk, um, not when they were sitting there trying to urge some thoughts out of themselves, um, looking at their screen. So for students, I would say, you know, it's really good to, to get the prompt if you have to write a paper or if you're looking, if you're trying to study something, um, to, get, to get the ideas going, especially if you have to write something, but then go outside and take your phone, um, go for a walk and then, hit that record button when the things occur to you because what after about a mile and before you're too tired you'll start to have those really flowy thoughts and if you wait till you get back home you'll forget them and then that it's just as though you didn't do it but if you if you just tap that recorder and do it in that place when your mind's really flowing well um you get some great ideas and your papers will be like they'll write themselves that's a great little tip. I like that. I'll, I'll share that with my student. Um, there, so another question, I think this is also like in terms of tips. Uh, Elena says, since the metaphors we live by apply physically and intellectually and inform the way we relate to ourselves, what should we be thinking about with regard to self-talk? So how, what's, what, what, like how, do we, how do we coach ourselves, I think is the, the gist of this. What do we tell ourselves? How do we, how do we direct ourselves to more healthy mind body flourishing. well maybe i mean the first thing that we ought to be doing with regard to self talk is just realize um that that one one that one side of this always affects the other side and so when we feel um when we feel like we we don't have the energy for anything for example when people are um when when not at the depths of depression or anything like that because that that it it you you can't get the motivation to do it, but when we feel low, when we feel um, sad or tired or like we don't want to do, doing physically doing something else. And yoga, the reason that yoga is such a great one for this, and Elena knows this, is because when you I happen to know Elena more, when you um, when you do um, yoga, I mean the promise here is just lie in a butterfly position and just breathe. You don't have to do anything, but before you know it, these relaxy things turn into these physically things, and these physically things turn into this deep, deep breathing, and this breathing as it takes over, takes over the mood, and you get up, and you feel like doing it, even though you didn't feel like doing it to begin with, and a lot of times, right, when we're talking about, um, I mean, our self-talk, when we think that I'm and the, one of the, the worst things, right, is that, oh, I did badly at this. And so I'm so, I'm, I'm so pitiful. I'm so angry with myself. I'm so bad at this, right? A thing to do is something physical that will take you, that you're good at. Something, whatever your, your talents are, right? That, oh, I'm just feeling like I failed at this, solving this intellectual problem or, or writing this, whatever it was I was trying to write. And so maybe I go shoot hoops because I'm really good at that. Or maybe I tune this guitar and play some because I'm really good at, at, at this thing. Um, because they both sides are going to inform us. But if Elena has a, a um, more specific um, way of, of framing that question or, or, or a follow-up to that so I can see what exactly is going on, maybe I could say something else. Yeah, just at the risk of being a little bit um, provocative, let me, let me just throw kind of a critical question your way and, and see how what you might say is that there's a kind of ableism wrapped into what you're saying, which is hmm. that, you know, so unbalanced, inflexible, non-strong people that lack endurance, like some, there's, maybe there's something also wrong with their character. And I wonder, like, I know this isn't where, what you would suggest, but 
how, how would you respond if someone said, well, you know, there's some people have diseases that like, ver you have ver I mean, vertigo is a disease and you lose your sense of balance. Yeah, you know? and it certainly um, is. And yeah. right, and not, I mean, exactly. And not just that, right? Um, but we also have, we have um, bipolar disease. We have depression. We have things that will knock us off balance. And my, my initial interest in this was simply was simply about the conceptual metaphors that I don't think that I, that we get these ideas um, from playing off the physical, because in a lot of times, I mean, what what about that child who is um, in wheelchair bound and is unable to do all a lot of the a lot of these things? Are we saying that this person that this child doesn't have a conception of unfairness? I don't think so. Um, I'm my my point is that these these children babies have <laughs> they have the 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 intellectual side just as soon at, or equal to um, the physical side. So I don't think what I'm trying not to say is that everything is derivative from the physical because based on what you've just said, it, the suggestion would be that. Um, if we took into account physical disability, we would then we would have to say that here's a bunch of people who can never think. And that's exactly not the way that goes, right? Because we are complex dynamic systems and we're just describing different levels of things. And the great thing about that is that these levels are completely independent, right? With respect to description, there's top-down causation, bottom-up causation. And so if I'm right, and these are not merely metaphors, I think this is a problem for what you just raised is a problem for embodied cognition people. I don't think it's going to be a problem for me because my suggestion is, well, fine, but mental, I mean, but moral concepts, mental concepts, psychological concepts are derived completely independently of the physical. And so they can, as you notice, I said, these can influence one another, but I never made the claim that they do or they must influence one another. Um, because we, we know, I mean, I, I'm quite sure that we have some bipolar um, world-class athletes. And do we mean that they don't have balance because the, this mental balance? No, I don't mean that at all. What I, all I'm saying is, that you don't need to have the physical as the basis in order to get um, the mental concepts, the psychological concepts, the moral concepts, the spiritual concepts to fly or to operate. Yeah, I mean, this this is this is really interesting. I mean, health itself is like a, a normative. I mean, it has this normative element, and it's always a worry about the non-healthy. Like, how what do we, you know? I, yeah. Be, before we run out of time, see, we, we got about two minutes left. Um, I'm wondering, is it like, you know, people are interested in this. Could you give some suggestions for further research or like a, a couple books or recommendations? You mentioned that, the, I heard you mention Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Is there any other other texts that people could look at or if they're interested in these ideas? I Well, you know what? I would start with um, listening to Ginger Campbell's podcast, um, The Brain Science. I listen to Inquiring Minds. I, I think the best way to go, I mean, I, I have 40 books on longevity and it's all, you know, I know a number of authors of books on, uh, on yoga, but I don't, I mean, I think the best way to, to start is broadly. And so with some of these um, podcasts like um, uh, Michael Shermer's, uh, well, it's called the Michael Shermer Show. He's a skeptic in general, but he interviews a lot of really interesting people. Inquiring Minds with Andre Vistantes. Um, she interviews a number of people. She's a neuroscientist, but interviews a number of people who could speak on both sides of the story. And I think that's the best way. In fact, I put, I put podcast links in my canvas all the time for students because I think when you, when you start like that, then you get the recommendations and then you can read I don't know that that um, most of our our students are all that interested in like hauling off with a book to start with. <laughs> but there is one great one if you're interested in reading something a thousand pages long and absolutely wonderful and hilarious and interesting. 
And that's Robert Sapolsky's book, uh, Behave, because he talks there about um, our actions at every, like fractions of a second before what happens in our bodies, fractions of a second before any decision, all the way down to millions of years before we make a decision. Um, when oxytocin and vasopressin first emerged in um, simple animals. And he, he also is the guy who wrote why um, zebras don't get ulcers, um, which is about how we deal with trauma or how we don't deal with it. And then there's also one more I just now made, it just came to mind is the body keeps the score. And that's about how we embody the traumas that we've gone through and physiological um, symptoms emerge um, from psychological problems, which I think also supports kind of the view that I'm talking about. And also um, he gives some sense of how we might through bodily um, behaviors work on some of those traumas that we all have. Anybody yeah, who's older than two and has lived for the last couple of years has traumas. Obviously, I mean, there's like a whole literature. I mean, this is really, really cool. Um, thank you for sharing those recommendations. And I think you're right about the podcast students, students like those. Um, I see we're out of time. So Candace, Professor Shelby, you know, if we were in a room together embodied, we all give you a round of applause, but <clears throat> we'll do a virtual uh, applause. <laughs> thank <laughs> you so thank, much. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. And um, if folks in the audience, we're going to post the video of this if you want to check it out later. We'll be on our YouTube page. Thank you.